Hello, I am Dr. Shruti Chaturvedi, a hematologist from the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, and today I'll be talking about the complexities and comorbidities that impact the diagnosis and outcomes of TTP or thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. In addition to discussing how comorbidities add complexity to the management of acute TTP, I'll also touch on the long-term adverse health sequelae or comorbidities that can occur after recovery from TTP, and finally discuss pregnancy and its interaction with TTP. While pregnancy is a physiologic state, it does add complexity to management here. So first talking about the pre-existing morbidities that we have to keep in mind while treating patients with TTP. We know now that immune TTP is an acute life-threatening disorder that's characterized by recurrent episodes of microvascular thrombosis. And these thrombosis lead to the clinical manifestations, which is impairment of various organs. It's caused by an autoantibody mediated deficiency of the enzyme ADAMTS13, which cleaves von Willebrand factor into smaller fragments that can circulate in the blood without causing thrombi. Therapy with plasma exchange and immunosuppression has revolutionized the treatment of TTP and mortality has gone from over 90% to less than 10% with acute episodes. In terms of comorbidities that are common in patients presenting with TTP, we've got older age and up to one in five or 20% of patients with TTP will be older than 60 years of age. There are autoimmune disorders that are quite common in patients presenting with TTP or in fact any other autoimmune hematological disorder, cardiovascular disease, cancer, and finally other comorbidities. And over here, older age is associated with cardiovascular disease, a higher rate of cancer, as well as other comorbidities. So it often compounds the issue with older patients. We know that older age adversely impacts the diagnosis as well as the outcomes of TTP. And this is because older adults may present somewhat atypically. For example, in the study from the French registry where 71 of 340 or about 20% of patients were older than 60 years of age, you'll notice that they had a much higher rate of neurologic symptoms such as delirium and seizures, behavioral abnormalities. Their renal function was poorer with significantly higher serum creatinine. And their platelet count was also higher than patients that were less than 60 years of age. What this translates into is some diagnostic challenges. For example, the French score, which is really very effective in identifying patients with TTP, relies on a low plated count less than 30,000 and the absence of significant renal impairment to identify patients with TTP. However, the sensitivity of the score goes down from 80% in younger patients to only 60% in adults over the age of 60. This is a significant difference and leads to delays in diagnosis, which can translate into worse outcomes, including mortality. The same study also showed that one month mortality, which is a surrogate for mortality from the acute TTP episode, as well as medium term mortality, was much higher in older adults, going from less than 10% at less than 50 years of age to well over 50% at one year and over 40% at 30 days in adults over the age of 80. There are multiple causes of this that include delays in diagnosis and more ischemic organ impairment in older adults that may start with some organ dysfunction. The next most common comorbidity in patients with TTP is autoimmune disorders. There is a tendency for multiple autoimmune disorders to co-occur in the same individual, which highlights perhaps a genetic predisposition to autoimmunity. And there are high rates of autoimmune in disease in patients presenting with TTP. For example, in this study from Germany, the rates of multiple autoimmune disorders, such as systemic lupus, Hashimoto's disease, ITP, celiac disease, and psoriasis, were much higher than expected in the general population. To pull out one example, the rate of lupus was 6.5% compared to 0.025% in the general population. In a study from the United States, from a nationwide inpatient sample, which is a representative sample of hospitalizations, 8.7% of patients admitted with TTP had an underlying connective tissue disorder or autoimmune disorder. As expected in our population here, many of these were female and black and were more likely to have other comorbidities, 
So more than one comorbidity was present in over 45% of patients with autoimmune disorders and only 31% without. And while the presence of a connective tissue disorder does not seem to impact acute mortality or the rates of events such as stroke, heart attacks, and cardiac arrest, it does translate into a longer duration of hospitalization, approximately 18 versus 15 days, and higher inpatient costs by quite a large margin. So for a patient with autoimmune diseases, the mean inpatient cost was $76,000 versus $59,000 for those without. Next, I'm going to touch on the complications that can occur during the acute TTP episode. And the most significant of these are cardiac events. Now, cardiac symptoms are quite common in patients presenting with immune TTP. These include things like myocardial infarction, cardiogenic shock, as well as arrhythmias and heart failure that can occur due to ischemia. Several studies have now shown us that troponin elevation as a marker of cardiac dysfunction is also a risk factor for death from TTP, as well as for refractory TTP that does not respond well to standard treatment with plasma exchange and immunosuppression. From the recent French study, we also see that cardiac involvement predicts one month mortality, and the odds for this are as high as 5.8. And this was in a model that is adjusted for other morbidities such as age. Another morbidity that can occur during acute TTP and one that is less commonly recognized or thought of is venous thromboembolism. A recent study from Canada reported on 123 episodes of acute TTP in 77 patients and found that 18% had venous thromboembolic events. And when we included only deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism and excluded superficial vein thrombosis, this rate was 14%. What's important to note is that at the time that these events occurred, patients were not on pharmacologic prophylaxis, but had for the most part recovered their platelet counts. And the median platelet count was normal at 175,000. So this highlights the importance of starting venous thromboembolism prophylaxis once the patient's platelet count is over 50,000. At this point of time, the bleeding risk is low but our patients are still at higher risk of clotting than other patients because TTP at the end of the day is a thrombotic disorder. And this brings us to the potential role of caplicizumab in reducing thromboembolic events, but also improving outcomes across the board. Caplicizumab is a nanobody and this binds to the A1 domain of von Willebrand factor. And by doing this, it blocks the interaction of platelets with von Willebrand factor, thus blocking the formation of platelet aggregates and this leads to faster recovery of platelet count. And in the phase three Hercules trial, it also reduced the composite of TTP related death, recurrence, as well as major thromboembolic events by 74%. And this was driven primarily by reducing the rate of early recurrences, which would otherwise be termed exacerbations occurring within 30 days of stopping plasma exchange. Now we would expect caplicizumab to prevent thromboembolic events, but in this study, the rate of major events was similar to that of placebo. However, there was somewhat sooner normalization of organ damage markers, such as the lactate dehydrogenase level, the cardiac troponin, as well as the serum creatinine. The next topic I'll touch on is the long-term adverse health events that occur after TTP. TTP survivors are clearly at risk for premature death, a follow-up study of 57 patients from the Oklahoma registry showed, as seen in this figure on the left, that the probability of survivor of TTP patients shown here in red is significantly lower than an age and sex adjusted reference population from the United States shown up here in black. For example, at 15 years, the probability of a TTP survivor being alive is only 67% compared to 95.8% from the adjusted US population. When we look at the cause of death from available registries, such as the Oklahoma registry shown here in blue, as well as some unpublished data from Johns Hopkins and the Ohio State University, we note that while relapse is a cause of death occurring in 12.5% of the patients in the Oklahoma registry and 27% in the combined cohort from Hopkins and Ohio State, cardiovascular disease is actually the leading cause of death with 37.5% in the Oklahoma registry and over 27% in the Hopkins and Ohio State cohort. 
This includes events such as myocardial infarction, stroke, congestive heart failure, etc. It does not account for the other deaths in which patients also had cardiovascular comorbidities such as coronary artery disease or hypertension. And when we start thinking of a population that is dying at a disproportionate rate due to cardiovascular illnesses, it does make us think of what else is going on along with them. And in another analysis from the Oklahoma cohort, the authors found that the prevalence of certain common morbidities that are also risk factors for cardiovascular disease, such as lupus, hypertension, and diabetes, are much higher in patients with TTP than expected from an age and sex adjusted reference population. In line with this, a recent study also found that TTP survivors are at a higher rate of stroke that occurs during a TTP remission than expected from age and sex match controls. Now this does not include strokes that occur during TTP episodes and these events all occurred when patients had normal platelet counts. The rate of stroke in TDP patients in remission was 13% versus an expected rate of 2.6% from the general population. Stroke is a major morbidity, and there are multiple possible explanations for this. The first one is that there is just a higher rate of traditional risk factors such as hypertension, lupus, and obesity in patients with TDP. But the second question that comes up is that, is this anything to do with incomplete recovery of ADMTS-13 activity during remission? Where does this come from? This comes from the fact that we know that ADMTS-13 is very important for von Braun factor cleaving and maintaining circulatory function. It is involved in the development and progression of ischemic stroke in multiple animal studies. And even in general population studies, reduced ADMTS-13 activity is associated with stroke. And finally, we know that there are some patients with TTP that do not recover ADMTS-13 activity completely during remission. In the Rotterdam study, the authors found that low ADMTS-13 activity, even within the normal range, is associated with a host of adverse cardiovascular outcomes, including coronary artery disease and stroke, as well as all-cause mortality. Almost 6,000 adults over the age of 55 were followed for a median of 10 years and were divided into quartiles based on their ADAMTS-13 activity at enrollment. And what's seen here is that the rate of stroke was highest in those that were in the lowest ADAMTS-13 quartile with 7.3% rate of stroke compared to the quartile with the highest ADAMTS-13 activity which had a stroke rate of only 3.6%. What's notable here is that the ADAPTS-13 activity in quartile one, which had the highest risk of stroke was 71%, which would actually fall into the normal range for most laboratories, indicating that this appears to be a dose dependent effect. Now in patients with TTP, less than half recover ADMTS-13 activity into the normal range. And this is data from a study that followed ADMTS-13 measurements during remission for 52 patients. And these are activities measured only subsequent to 30 days after recovering from an acute episode. And the majority of patients seem to have ADMTS-13 activities in remission that range between 10 to 70%. And this was prior to the era of preemptive rituximab. And in the same study, having reduced ADAMTS-13 activity less than 70% or less than normal was significantly associated with the rate of stroke. So this brings us to a new model of vascular disease in TTP survivors where ADAMTS-13 does play a role. In the figure over here, you have time on the x-axis and ADAMTS-13 activity on the y-axis. If your ADAMTS-13 activity is less than 10% or in the red zone, this is where acute TTP can occur. But there are a large number of patients that live between 10 and 70%, so just subnormal. And there is the potential of cumulative vascular injury that is occurring due to a subclinical TMA, where you do have large Wilbrand factor multimers. There is subclinical plated activation and aggregation, an activation of the endothelial cells, and perhaps involvement of complement. This cumulative vascular injury reduces the threshold to have a major cardiovascular event such as stroke. 
Now, it is also possible that some of the vascular events or some of the sequelae that we see in patients with DTP could just represent residual injury from an acute episode. And finally, as I've mentioned before, there is a role of other comorbidities that are prevalent at higher rates in this population. One of the other morbidities that has garnered quite a lot of attention for TTP survivors is cognitive impairment, because many patients after recovering from TTP report significant difficulties with memory and concentration. The word that they often use is a brain fog. In 24 patients from the Oklahoma Registry, neurocognitive evaluation was done, and the authors noted deficits in complex attention and sequencing, manual dexterity, as well as rapid language generation and memorization. In another study of 27 patients from the Ohio State University and from London, patients appeared to have impairments in tests of visual learning and memory. And interestingly, these patients that were otherwise asymptomatic in terms of overt neurologic impairment, 39% of them had evidence of ischemic lesions on MRI. This highlights a potential role of silent infarction that may lead to neurocognitive impairment. And this is a phenomenon that has been noted in other disorders such as sickle cell disease, but also in the general population, albeit in older adults. Depression and other adverse psychological impairments are also common after TTP. In the Oklahoma registry, 59% of patients had a positive screen for depression. In a larger cross-sectional survey from the United States and Canada that was done along with a patient support organization, over 80% had a positive screen for depression and 32% tested positive on a screen for post-traumatic stress disorder. Now, because this was done as a survey, there is the potential for selection bias. However, these are still very concerning numbers. What the study also found was that depression and post-traumatic stress were clearly associated with patients being unemployed and them attributing this to TTP, highlighting that this has very significant social and economic consequences for patients. And finally, coming to pregnancy and TTP. Most of us are aware that pregnancy may be when TTP initially presents, and this applies to both congenital as well as acquired TTP. So up to 5 to 30% of all adult onset TTP presents for the first time during pregnancy. And of the patients that present during pregnancy, anything between 24 to 66% represent congenital TTP. Although congenital TTP is very rare, it is quite common for it to present for the first time in pregnancy. Individuals don't always have to present in childhood. And this presents diagnostic difficulties for both congenital and acquired TTP. This is because anemia and thrombocytopenia are common and frequently expected and known to be benign in pregnancy. They may not get as much attention as in a non-pregnant individual. The differential diagnosis of a thrombotic microangiopathy when you do make that diagnosis in pregnancy is broad and includes other disorders such as atypical hemolytic uremic syndrome as well as the HELP syndrome. And this is why testing for item TS-13 activity becomes key. And even today, this is not something that is readily available at all institutions all over the world. In terms of managing TTP during pregnancy, particularly congenital TTP, plasma infusion is a standard of care. However, patients may still get plasma exchange plus immunosuppression until the diagnosis of congenital TTP is established. And this is because acquired TTP is more common and it is more prudent to treat with immunosuppression and plasma exchange until we know. The outcomes of congenital TTP are much worse when they present in the second trimester or sometime between the 20th to 29th week. For example, in this British series of six patients that presented between 20 to 29 weeks, there was only one live birth and that individual had a baby with intrauterine growth retardation. The other five babies unfortunately did not make it. Compared to this, when congenital TTP presents less than 20 weeks, all three pregnancies resulted in live births. And similarly, at greater than 30 weeks, all 11 pregnancies presented with live births. For immune or acquired TTP in pregnancy, the standard of care is treatment with plasma exchange and immunosuppression, commonly with corticosteroids. And similar to congenital TTP, outcomes are worse when patients present within the second trimester or between week 20 to 29, where in this example of four pregnancies, only one resulted in a live birth. Now, Getting pregnant after 
recovering from TTP may also come with risk. So for women that have a prior history of acute TTP, a subsequent pregnancy may precipitate relapse, which is why it is so important to monitor their labs, including RMTS-13 activity closely during pregnancy, but if given the opportunity, ideally before pregnancy as well, because there is a role of elective rituximab to normalize RMTS-13 activity before pregnancy to try to prevent relapse. There is little data on women that become pregnant after recovering from TTP, but a series of 16 pregnancies from Oklahoma noted that there is a higher rate of preeclampsia in these women, and this will also need to be monitored closely. So what I've summarized for you is that there are comorbidities that can be pre-existing or can occur during or after recovery from TTP that can complicate the management of patients with TTPs. However, with all of these challenges also come opportunities. For example, at the stage of diagnosis, we've noted that atypical presentations in older adults or other individuals and less availability of rapidly resulting RMTS-13 activity can delay diagnosis and lead to worse outcomes. But this presents opportunities for clinician education, re-evaluation of a clinical decision scores, as well as increasing access to lab testing. During the acute TTP episode, morbidity and mortality comes from thromboembolic events. Rapid diagnosis and treatment can help limit this, as can the addition of novel treatments such as caplosizumab. And finally, there is poor long-term survival and high rate of cardiovascular disease in patients with TTP. And this is a call for further research to evaluate risk factors and the mechanisms of poor outcomes but also for multidisciplinary care and survivorship care to improve outcomes in this population. In summary, age and comorbidities are associated with worse outcomes in TTP. TTP, we now know, is a chronic relapsing disorder associated with poor long-term outcomes. Survivors have many comorbidities as well as shortened survival. And cardiovascular disease is a leading cause of morbidity and mortality after TTP. Finally, prompt treatment of acute TTP and a focus on survivorship will improve short and long-term outcomes. Thank you very much for participating in this activity. I do hope that you found it useful.